Welcome to the Strategy Sherpa Show, a series of organic discussions between hosts David Chavez and a variety of notable business leaders centered around their most significant failures and how they handled those challenges so listeners can learn from their most teachable moments and apply the lessons to their organizations. Now, here's your host, David Chavez. Hey everyone, this is David Chavez, the Strategy Sherpa, and boy, do we have a great guest today. Um, I have known Vern for quite a while. As a matter of fact, he's probably the catalyst of me changing my life altogether. And um, just want to uh, um, introduce Vern Harnish with Scaling Up. David, great to be on the show. Good to see you. Yeah, it's great to have you, Vern. Um, I, I, like I said, you're one of the catalysts, and I like to tell a little story. And I don't know, I, I think I've told you before, but it's been so long ago that I'll, I'll just reshare it and share it for the audience, too. In 2001, when I was the president of the EO San Diego chapter, I came to a leadership conference where this guy named Vern Harnish was speaking on his new book, Mastering the Rockefeller Habits. And I got to see one of the first speeches you did on the book. And um, I did like all good entrepreneurs, Vern, I did, took the book back and threw it on my desk where it sat a couple of years. And then when the pain started happening, then the growth of my company picked it up and started using it. And I share this with people because I was a valuation guy. I started reading the books. We started implementing it in our firm and I tripled my evaluation in three years. And that blew my mind. Uh, being involved in exit planning, buying and selling companies. And then here's this book that comes along and we just read it and start implementing it. And it triples my valuation in three years. So that was one of the great things that happened. And I, I, I don't know if you have anything to say about that, but that's what it did for me. Good. Well, <clears throat> that was always the idea of the book. Our, our fundamental brand promise which is what we encourage every company to figure out. It's the starting point of your flywheel is ours is to scale the valuation. Now that involves obviously revenue and profitability and your own time in the company. There's a lot of factors that go into what actually drives the valuation of the business, but that has always been our promise since I launched that executive program for EO as, as EO's founder, I then launched this executive program in 91 and took 10 years to try to really figure out how are we going to create a parenting manual? There's a lot of stuff for startups. I have an MBA supposed to teach us how to run the grown-up companies, but there wasn't a parenting manual. And so it's been a fun ride. This is David, my 41st year of doing this. So it truly is oh, wow. a project. That's interesting. And then I'm in my 14th year of being one of the scaling up coaches with the organization. I think that was coach number 35 when you were actually counting them. So nice. been do we've been doing this a long time now. And of course, I've, I've uh, leveraged some of the stuff you're doing. And I, I love one of the things you say, and I want to bring that to the audience attention. I think that one of the things I love about scaling up the most is it gives the framework. And you always say it gives the rules for writing the music but the music is still yours to write. And I say that to people as one of your best quotes ever, because it really, the scaling up system really allows the business to do what it's doing and not try to change it to some structured program that one size fits all. Yeah, we've always used more of a jazz analogy. Uh, my son, my, one of my uh, four children is a jazz drummer. And I love that you can bring in musicians from all over the world uh, who've never played together, and they can end up creating some beautiful music as long as you have a common set of rules and you're on the same you know sheet of music, which is right, like right. our one-page strategic plan. And by the way, today we have 257 coaching partners on Six Continents, so we've had a little bit of growth uh, as well. Yeah, it's been a fun ride for me. I think that you have gotten all of us coaches actively involved so we can help you even do better things. And we've leveraged you, you've leveraged us. And it's, I think most of the coaches, I can speak for most of us, we just love being a part of this organization because it really provides some great mind share and things like that. And I'm glad COVID's over. So we're all getting together again. So I'm really enjoying that. So yeah, we'll um, all be at Harvard. We've got that new partnership with Harvard. Uh, mm -hmm. Like we had the earlier partnership with MIT and so excited about having a bunch of us up there on campus here in about three, I think three weeks. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to going that with you because I invited a couple of clients and they're coming. And then we're all heading to Pennsylvania right afterwards to be with all the scaling up coaches. So yeah, you got it. Yeah. It's a great, it's a it'll month. be a great, yeah, it'll be great all together. Hey, Vern. So what we do in this show is we talk about some of our biggest mistakes. And I, I think you already have queued yourself up a little bit with that. But um, I, I, I'm just opening the floor up to you to start to share with the audience what what you're thinking about is what what was your one of your biggest mistakes? Well, hey, I've had a bunch, and I think anybody who's been in business, if you're not making mistakes, you're probably not pushing the envelope enough. But you know, I I, I really probably want to highlight three. Um, you know, the first is branding. Uh, you know, we got talking about you know starts with my name. I you know my first name is Vern. And by the way, you do not want to be in a bar with the name Vern. So I ended up having a bar name, Justin. And my last name was Case. My wingman, he'd go by Justin as well. In fact, I was just best best man in his, his wedding a, a few weeks ago. And he was just in time. And together we were just incredible. I know it was corny, but <laughs> at the time. And but but you know, I I didn't really plant this. I was listening to police last night. And, you know, I think that industry understands the importance of getting the name right. You know, he was Gordon Sumner. He changed his name to Sting. We were talking about the founder of Marvel um, changed his name to Stan Lee so that everybody could pronounce it and remember it. And so that was my first mistake. You know, I named the company Gazelles. I thought that was going to be clever. That's the technical term that David Birch at MIT gave to growth companies mice, gazelles, and elephants, but nobody could spell it. I hated almost giving out my e <laughs> my email address. How many Zs, how many Ls, is there an S at the end? And so we went through the process of changing our name from you know gazelles to scaling up, which were the two words uh, that we want to own in the marketplace. And so I would say, and we can talk about how to come up with that and all of it, but I think the first mistake I made uh, was branding. And I didn't put enough thought into it. And then you get invested. And we, and I'm not going to say we wasted 15 years, but I think I could have had a better brand from the beginning. So, so basically what you're saying is you waste a little bit of time, resources, and maybe even a little bit of market share for the first few years, because it maybe hurt a little bit of uh, developing your market share, right? Because of the confusion. I, I think absolutely. Okay. Um, and so first, hopefully folks give a little bit more thought um, into what they ought to call the company. And uh, because, man, you want to you want to go big and you want to make sure that it's one that you're going to stick with. I think the second you know, mistake I made early on and here I was arrogant. I I was dutifully losing money there in the late 90s, like you were supposed to, supposedly, as we went from half a million to a million to two million to four million, we're getting ready to do eight million. And I'm out raising 10 million to do an acquisition. And the money folks kept saying, look, I think your business model is broken. You're running a 42% gross margin. We think it ought to be 55%. And I'm like, no, I'm smarter than you guys. And sure enough, I got my head handed to me. Uh, when 9-11 hit, we lost about a million dollars in eight weeks. And again, I'd been dutifully losing money from my, you know, that investors had put in because I was, quote, growing, but I was actually growing broke. That's where that <laughs> term came from. I was living my own nightmare. And, you know, we can talk in the next segment how I fixed it. But I really had a broken business model that was leading to me growing broke no different than what happened with Michael Dell as he went from zero to a billion. Uh, and then I'd say the, the third mistake was me leading the organization. I think you, you need to understand what are your strengths. And I, at the end of the day, am more of a teacher than I am an entrepreneur. And so the fact that I was CEO uh, was the problem. And so we can talk about, again, how I address and fix those. But I think getting branding right, the word or two you want to own, uh, making sure that your business model is, is going to scale. And number three, uh, are you really, as the entrepreneur, the one that should actually lead 
the organization. Uh, you know, Steve Jobs came back as ICEO, but it was clear that Tim Cook was really the head of the organization. And the only function that he enjoyed was marketing. So he chaired the three-hour marketing meeting every Wednesday afternoon, uh, even though he still maintained the title. And that's what really drove our, our tool, the face tool, the function accountability chart. And so after break, we can tell some stories that I learned from that then caused me to wake up and get some real leadership in the organization. Well, it's it's really interesting because you talked about the three mistakes and one of the, the second one, the business model, it's really interesting doing our work because people fall in love with their business model so much yeah. that it's hard for them to really get their strategy in place because they've fallen in love. I, I, I use that quote from Jack Welch, strategy is not a lengthy action plan. It's an evolution of a central idea through continually changing circumstances. That's one of my favorite quotes. And I know you're the one who shared it with me originally, but but it's one of those quotes that's so true because people fall in love with their path of where they're going instead of falling in love with where they're going. Um, and so the way they're doing it and um, that that hurt a lot of companies during COVID. I, I mean, I know when COVID started, I got got with all the companies I work with and I got them focused on that BHAG and kept them focused on that. And they all did fairly well. Um, it's just the difference of wh whether you're looking at just your business model and you can't change it or that long term. So I look forward to having that conversation with you. But we have um, your branding, the business model. And the last one was I, I'm trying to remember again. Well, and then leadership. Um, OK, you know what? Leadership. What? You know, understanding what are your true strengths uh, and weaknesses as a leader and should you really be the head of the company? It's different than title. Right. Um, and when we come back from break, I'll tell you a little bit about Randy Amon. Okay. All right. And and, and um, Vern, where, where are you living now? Because you've been jumping around a little bit lately. Where are you residing and where have you been lately? Just to well, uh, yeah. lead it up to the break. Well, when what I was 20, uh, I went to a program at Harvard. And this guy said, you only have to make three decisions. You know, when you're 20. And he said, you know, the weather you enjoy, the hobbies you enjoy, and the kind of people you like to be around, because you can't change those. And so I've really settled on my two favorite spots on the planet, Boulder, Colorado, and Barcelona, Spain, kind of mountains and Mediterranean. So I've got three of my children of my four are still are in Barcelona. So lots of reasons to be there. And then I was born and raised in this area. It's called the Niwot Curse. So I'm back for a fourth time in Boulder. So it'll be between those two places. All right. Well, that's great. Well, we're heading up to a break and um, look forward to having the conversation with you. Everybody, we have Vern Harnish with us. He is the founder of Scaling Up um, and one of the people that really has have driven my success and many others like me. And then also the success of our clients and the work we do with them. So it's a real honor to have him here. We'll be right back after the messages. Thank you. Hey everybody, David Chavez here, Strategy Sherpa, here with Vern Harnish with Scaling Up. And Vern's going to share some of his wisdom with us because he has three mistakes he identified in the first segment with us. And now he's going to run through what happened to make them mistakes. So the first one, I think, Vern, was branding. So branding yourself, maybe your name, things like that. Yeah, you know, you just, you think you're clever. And, um, and, you know, and it reminds me of Tim Ferriss, you know, when Tim wrote his first famous book for our work week, that was not the title. And if you know, Tim, he's quite a nerdy, you know, heady guy. And he had this kind of nerdy, weird title. And thank goodness there was some smart publishers around him that said, look, Tim, that's never going to fly. Why don't you go back and really test? And that's what he did. To his credit, he tested various names in four-hour work week, uh, which ended up being just one of the most brilliant names that you could title a book. Because by the way, a lot of its contents, the, very much the same as my Mastering the Rockefeller Habits uh, kind of thing. How do you reduce from you know 40 hours to four hours or 80 hours to eight hours, the time it takes for you to, to run the business, which is what we are able to achieve with the client's but I love the fact that he really tested it uh, with the AB split, 
we were, things were just coming online when that book came out. And so he was able to do that. And I think if I had been a little bit more diligent in testing the name with people, uh, I think it would have been helpful. But I just thought I was smart and clever and and Gazelle's was uh, the name. You know, the second in terms of the business model, I you know, no, again, it, part of it was just the time in that at the late 90s, you were expected to lose money. You were expected to raise money. <clears throat> so I raised not much. I raised half a million initially uh, from five angels, 100,000 apiece. And then I started growing. And because I was losing money growing, I just thought, well, this must be a good sign. And we saw the day of reckoning happen here just a few months ago in the tech sector, where all of a sudden people are saying, you know what? Maybe you ought to actually put together a business model that has at least a path towards profitability. And I didn't. And the 9-11 losses really were a wake-up call for me that said, maybe what I should be doing is benchmarking other folks that are similar in the industry. And that's when I, I jumped on the bandwagon of the Apollo Group, and which was Phoenix uh, University of Phoenix and others. And even though they weren't exactly us, I dug into their, their business model and their numbers. And sure enough, they were running just exactly what the folks that were trying to, you know, I was trying to raise money from were saying, you need to be at a 55% gross margin. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it finally took the market hitting me upside the head, you know, with a two by four for me to, to, you know, realize that that's what I needed to achieve. Now, in the next segment, we'll talk about how I was actually able to fix it. But uh, it took a lot of pain, David, for me to yeah. recognize uh, that. Well, you know, you know, interesting, like, like you're saying, you took you a two by four to hit you over the head. I think a lot of people who start businesses, entrepreneurs, one of the things that gets the business off the ground is that bullheadedness, right? Yeah. Um, that drive, that just focus and drive. And then that becomes their nemesis growing the firm uh, or the company that they're trying to grow over time is that bullheadedness stops them from really getting what they want. So it's very tied together. Yeah, you know, you're right. It may, makes me think of Marshall Goldsmith, who, who's, you know, course is one of the many that we host. Uh, his book, What Got You Here, Won't Get You There, is absolutely real. So our name that got us started didn't get us to where we needed to. My business model that we got started on wasn't going to get us to where we needed to. And then third was um, me as the leader. You know, mm -hmm. you just think that naturally the entrepreneur should be the CEO. And, uh, you know, so I think of, of Randy Amon. He was one of the thousands of CEOs. I moved through that MIT program and I loved his title. He had a company called ABL Cables. They were out of Baltimore, Maryland. They did cable assemblies for various uh, computer manufacturers or, and uh, his title was founder and head of customer service. So it didn't change his ownership structure much he still had, you know, ninety percent of the company, but he realized that on our face tool, our function accountability tool, the only function he really enjoyed and had passion for was the customer service side of the business, and so he brought in a CEO and a COO and a CFO and filled in all of those positions, which freed him up, David, to spend a year creating a, a platform that really provided much better customer service than anyone else in his industry, a $2 billion company came along and said, Randy, that's saving your company millions. It's going to save us tens of millions. Bought his firm for a gazillion dollars. And, and he's one of the few people who survived corporate world. And he just, it just got announced about three weeks ago. Uh, he is retiring as the senior VP, and you can guess it, of customer right. experience for a $40 billion global company. And nice. so he stuck to his knitting in terms of what was his strength and backfilled in all the other positions and didn't have an ego that meant that he needed to be CEO of his own organization. And I think 
that's what I had to realize is that, again, I'm a teacher and not really the, the person who ought to be scaling a company. Uh, again, those who teach usually are the ones who can't do. I joke about that, but I think it's true. Uh, yes. And I had to come to that realization. Well, it's funny you say that because you've had people running scaling up ever since I've been here. And I, and the first one that you had running it had just come in right about the time I came in. And it's been very good. And then you had to take it over and run it for a little bit. And one, I remember you saying to all of us coaches, like, look, I am not going to be the guy that runs this because I want it to continue to grow. And so uh, you brought in another leader, John, and he's done an amazing job really scaling this out with your help, of course. I mean, you're actively involved in it and then you support us tremendously. So it's been a good relationship for you. And then you, uh, every time you've done something with me and you up teaching, you could just you glow. So, you know, that's where, it, where that's where your glow is, right? <laughs> yeah, that's where, yeah, you got to play to your strengths. And I think right, Marcus right. Buckingham, you know, was right. And it's really sitting there and getting clear what gives you energy, what gives you strength, and what wears you out. And, yep. you know, I, I often joke, but I think it's true. Implementing everything I teach wears me out personally, but I know we have to do it. And so, we, as you know, we have three companies and they're all run by very talented and experienced uh, entrepreneur CEOs, much, ta much more talented than I am. And that's given me then the freedom, you know, to do the writing and speaking, which are the two things that I really love, love doing. Yeah. And, and that leads you to changing many people's lives like my own. I mean, just reading yeah. some of your stuff, being around it. Um understanding some of the mistakes I was making when I ran my company and the company I'm making running now. It's just, it's some of those mistakes. And I think that a lot of businesses, it's really interesting to me. This is their biggest problem is the leadership team and who's sitting in the seats and making sure those seats are all filled by the people that's going to take them to the next level. And a lot of companies get stuck with this team that's not growing and not able to do what the company really needs it to do to go to the next level. And you talk a lot about this, but I would say it's probably been one of my greatest challenges as a coach is getting yeah. people to really understand this. Yeah. And that's what I want to talk about in the next segment is, so how do you actually find those people? Because mm -hmm. man, you get the right team, your life is wonderful. You get the wrong team and your life is less wonderful. And yeah. it's the, you know, two or three biggest decisions that you're going to make and and there are right and wrong answers and so uh how you make that decision and go about it is something i want to focus on in our next segment well that's great um yeah you could, because you just wrote a book on compensation and talking about this very issue and it's been a great asset to, to us to have people read this because it's really eye-opening but yeah I'll, I'll let you talk about that and then also uh um one of the things about your branding, so you had this branding mistake and that goes for this gazelles, but you also have say you probably should have changed your personal name too. Oh yeah. I just, well, I, you know what? I, I should have gone with Vern Cameron. I, I think our, our lesson from the entertainment field is hardly any of them, you know, use the name that was given to them at birth. And that's been a really important decision for many of those entertainers. And again, like Stan Lee, who founded and led Mattel, he was smart enough to realize. I Early on where I saw it, I had a, uh, a good friend who helped me get a started uh, association, Collegiate Entrepreneurs, that led to YEO, then EO. And his name was Nicholas Alexopoulos. A uh, good Greek name out of Chicago. And much to the chagrin of his mom, he said, look, I really want to make it big, which he has in the finance world. And it's going to be a hard name for me to spell and for people to remember. And so he changed it to Nick Alexos, A-L-X, you know, O-S, L-E-X-O-S. And uh, I think it served him well at age 20 to have made that decision. And so I don't think it's just something you play with. Stan Lee did it on purpose, Nick did it on purpose, and Gordon Sumner did it on purpose as he rebranded as Sting, and I think yep. that served him well uh, along the way. 
yeah, who doesn't know Sting and love some of his music because he's done so many different things. So um, yeah. every genre is probably covered by him at one time or another. So <laughs> yeah, he's one of the music. guys that's been able to span multiple decades. And that's what we want to do as entrepreneurs. Uh, this is my 41st year, as I mentioned it. And, uh, you know, um, and, and that's why I wanted to get the leadership in place so I could do, you know, Peter Drucker wrote 39 books, uh, two thirds of those after age 65. So wow. he did most of his work and I turned 65 next year. So I'm looking forward to accelerating really my, my opportunity to impact the world. Then think about anything like retirement. Yeah, it's it's funny because when you ask people about retirement, um, if the, if somebody's a business owner and a true entrepreneur, they they'll look at you and say, "What's that?" <laughs> or they may say they're retiring, and I've had several friends retire to two years later start another company, so <laughs> because they're yeah. bored. So yeah, all right, Vern. Well, it's great conversation so far. We'll look forward to coming back to you uh, at the after the next break. And thank you very much. We have Vern Harnish with Scaling Up with us. It's a real honor to have him with us, and we'll look forward to having you come back right after the break. Thank you. Hey, everyone. I keep on jumping the gun here on the introduction back to the show. Um, that's because we have Vern Harnish with Scaling Up here, and he's been sharing us some great insights from uh, mistakes he's made over the years. And he's going to enlighten us with how he overcame those mistakes um, in the future years. So, Vern, first thing is the branding. So we talked a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, and you know, there I turned to the late Clay Christensen. We lost him last year to long-term illness at Harvard. And Clay popularized what I think is the most important strategy question, which is what's the job to be done? And to the extent that you can reflect in your name, the job to be done, that brand promise. And so that's what really led us when I wrote the book, Scaling Up. There, I was finally able to give a lot more thought to what is the job? we want to do in the marketplace and specifically help companies scale up their valuation. Um, or I think it needs to be a, a name like what standard oil, you know, the namesake of my first book, mastering the Rockefeller habits, John D Rockefeller, uh, that company was standard oil and later on made the big important decision to rebrand as Exxon, making sure they had a lot of X's and those things. Um, and if you look at the most successful companies, Amazon, Apple, Google, they're, they're names that in some sense reflect um, what it is they do. Amazon's got, you know, allows you to get everything you might want to get in the, in the Amazon. But they were also just fun and clever that people could remember. And that's what brand is, is just trying to own a word or two in the minds of the marketplace. And at some point, good and bad. We now talk about Googling things. Uh, if your name becomes kind of synonymous with the very job to be done search, then you've won and you've won big. So I hope folks will take a little more time on that with branding. You, 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 you brand yourself too. Did you not? Yeah. And that was another mistake I made. I, I called myself the growth guy. And uh, I think a lot of folks just thought that was either Viagra or other related. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> I'm not sure uh, that was a good idea as well, but it was the attempt to say, all right, how do you position yourself in other people's minds so they can refer to you? And so I had that brand for quite a while as well. Now, hopefully okay. I'm the scaling up guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That I, I think you're known as the scaling up guy now. So, but but it was just interesting. I didn't know that about the growth guy that people were yeah. doing that with you. But I could I could envision that and actually see that. All right. So um so thank you. So I think that what people what you did is really focused in. You hired Apollo. They really helped you um, pull this back and take a look at it. Well, I didn't hire a Apollo Group. I said you know what, I really should set aside my ego. I should go look at some very successful companies that are in a similar space and go study their business model, at least their numbers. And I saw the Apollo Group spent 13% on as a sales cost, 5% on R&D, creating new courses. Of course, they had a 55% gross margin. So after kind of being slap, slapped upside the head in 2001, I decided one of our core values now is to practice what we preach. 
And uh, one of my mentors, Jack Stack, The Great Game of Business, it was all about setting a critical number. So I made a decision in 2002. Look, I'm going to figure out what it takes to be at a 55% gross margin instead of a 42%. That was the focus that year. And we achieved it. And we have not been below 55% since. Mm -hmm. And I watch it like a hawk because now that we're facing inflation and wage pressures and all of that, my biggest concern for a lot of uh, companies is they're going to wake up a year from now and all of a sudden their gross margins are going to get crushed. Because, you know, as entrepreneurs, we're, we love to look at the top line. Hey, what was my revenue? They get, you know, if our accountants give us any kind of a financial statement, we'd skip it all, go right to the bottom line. But gross margin, and by the way, if you want to really drive valuation, you're going to get the highest valuation if you can actually show that your gross margin dollars have been growing. And but it ends up being the opposite, as I share in the book. Uh, people generally have a good gross margin until they hit about five, six million in revenue. And then they start adding middle management and systems and office space. And all of a sudden their margins just get crushed, not crushed, but they'll end up losing like four points of margin. It goes from 56 to 52%. Nobody thinks it's any big deal, but if you could add four points, that eight point difference on a million is 80 grand on 10 million is you know a new executive that you need yeah. to bring in which is what we want to talk about next so gross margin dollars and gross margin dollars per full-time equivalent uh employee is probably one of the most important money ball stats right if you're not careful we start throwing people at the problem and we end up being very sloppy and yeah. that's what you've got to fix is that sloppiness so and that that's was the second it, thing I got right, finally in 2002. Yeah, a lot of people do that too. Um, you know, they'll put it below the line and it's really top of the line, uh, the gross margin line. And so it's really important to go through and look through that. As a, as a CPA myself, you know, I see a lot of people look at the, and and I always, I, I use one of your quotes. This is my favorite quote of yours, just being a CPA. Revenue is vanity, profit is sanity, cash flow is king. You know, I, I share that with people all the time because um, I have a client when I first started working with him that was lost in revenue and no profitability. He has like 25% bottom line profitability now. And he just can't believe that he has 25%. And uh, all you have to do is focus on that number. You could focus on revenue, but focus on profit too, because profit's the real sanity. And uh, I think you just demonstrated that too. And gross margin, like, like you said, valuation guy, we always, that was the number. If it yeah. wasn't a close to industry standards, your number drops significantly, your valuation. So, yeah. you know, and one of our coaching partners, you know, he was running, it's not Facebook or Google, he's running a chain of telecommunication stores. He was selling pagers, later cell phones. And the industry average was 75,000 gross margin dollars per employee. Using our tools over a growth period, over seven years, he took that to 275,000 gross margin dollars per employee, four times industry average. And as you know, that's always been one of our measures. The difference between good and great is your three to five times industry average numbers. And when you're at 275,000 gross margin dollars per employee, guess what? takes all the pressure off what you need to pay people to keep them. Now you can pay them more, which means they can upsell more, which was the key to his gross margin. Now you're in a virtuous cycle instead of sucked in to a vicious cycle. And that's what we want to help companies out of is that vicious cycle they get in where they're fighting the market instead of really going with it. And then I think let's talk about leadership. Please, yeah. And, you know, here... Looking for that number two that, you know, we talk about strategist and orchestrator, um, that you're Tim Cook that could come in and run things. The thing that we've learned, David, is that's not a position you could headhunt in. It has to be somebody that you've had some long standing experience with. And when I when I started, I studied it and found that as a really critical pattern. Of course, there's always exceptions. Somebody came to me and said, but wait a second, what about Google? You know, the Google boys, 
uh, brought in Eric Schmidt as their CEO. And I thought, oh no, here's one of the most famous companies that's violating my rule. And then I dug into it. And what I found out very smartly is they put Eric Schmidt on the board for almost a year before. So that way they could test drive him, build a relationship, see if the old guy could fit into their younger culture, would get, you know, uh, kind of their new approach to business. And and we know in Google, a year is like dog years. You know, a year there's like seven <laughs> years anyplace else. But I thought that was very smart of those two young entrepreneurs to test drive Eric for almost a year before they put him in the CEO position. But what we really recommend, and I've done it many times, is I'll sit an entrepreneur down and said, all right, let's take a piece of paper out. And you already know this person. They're a previous employee that went and made it big, and now maybe they want to come back. It's a customer of yours that wants to kind of come over to your side of the business. It could be a supplier. It could be somebody you worked with in a previous company. And so all three of my CEOs, two of them were former students in that MIT program who then became clients, used our tools in order to scale significant companies and exit them. Daniel to 1,200 employees, John to 650 employees, exited for 14 times earnings. I mean, these are experienced CEOs. And then Andy Bailey brought on a very experienced tech CEO, Doug Waldner, for our tech group. And that makes up my counsel. That was the call I had just before I was jumping on with you. Every Monday, myself and those three CEOs and a president that John's put in place, his number two from his previous company. And that's part of the key with serial entrepreneurs. They will take, once they exited like John did, that usually the big company messes everything up, which they did. And <laughs> he's eventually got his entire team back uh, so they can rob the next bank. It's a little bit like Ocean's whatever they're on, 23 or whatever the case is, the movie. But you keep the old team together because you've already done the forming, storming, norming phase, which becomes yeah. critical. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting you say that because I've, I've worked with several people who have started new companies and they actually end up over time, they end up getting their whole team back. And that's the trust level is really high. Understanding of each other's strengths and weaknesses is really high. It really allows the team to really go faster. Yeah. Well, and that was Norm, uh, Norm Wasserman's research at Harvard, David, uh, and Ed Roberts did it similarly at MIT. Co-founders scale much faster than single founders. Three scale faster than two, four, you know, Airbnb's got three co-founders and they're still all there. Uh, four scale faster than three and five scale faster than four, then you run out of data points. And particularly if you launch a company with what we call an intact team, uh, you work together some other place and then you left. Now you've already got that intact team you can scale much further faster than if you're having to recruit in people that you don't know. So it's sort of like what Jim Collins says is get the right people on the bus. So you're saying all these are people are the right people. And then the bus will, then those people will decide where the bus is going and how to get there. Yeah. And day one, you can divide up the tasks. You right. know, as a single founder, you're you're doing everything on our yeah. phase tool. And if you've got co-founders, you can split it up. Yeah, it gets a little exhausting. So very interesting, Vern. Thank you for sharing um, some of the things to help you overcome some of these issues you've had uh, scaling your company. And we'll look forward to uh, hearing a little bit about what you're doing next and what you're doing now in the next segment. But um, thank you for um, all that you shared so far. And we'll look forward to hearing from you on the other side about what's next and what you're doing now. Hello everyone, this is David Chavez back with Vern Harnish with Scaling Up and we're going to give him a little bit of time to talk and I, I, I made a request of him because I wanted him to talk about one thing that he had done recently that's really um, helped a lot of people we're working with. Um, he wrote a book about compensation. So Vern, share us with a little bit about the book. Yeah, well, you know, if I were to look at two other big mistakes I've made uh, and I see a lot of entrepreneurs make, it's around pricing. And mm -hmm. I consider price compensation just pricing internally. And so first externally, and the reason it's so hard to get price and compensation right is that we're dealing with people. And people are not logical, they're psychological. 
And so it's understanding the psychology of pricing and it's understanding the psychology of setting compensation is what we really wanted to dig into. In fact, that's where I'm headed tomorrow. I'm on my way to Australia, then Brazil, and I'll be leading some sessions for EO chapters and YPO chapters on the scaling up pricing and compensation. And so, look, I think the first lesson is just spend some time on it. I see a lot of us just kind of, you know, we'll we'll get laser focused on the cost side of the business. But when it comes to setting price, we just lick our finger and put it to the wind. When there's some really important strategies you can use that can literally increase top and bottom lines by hundreds of percent. And um, Herman Simon's book, uh, Confessions of a, of a Pricing Man, is one that we encourage everybody to take a look at. He owns the largest pricing consultancy in the world. Uh, and then on compensation, it's just 100 pages. Uh, and so we'd encourage everybody listening to take a look at it because the mistake is we end up cutting all these individual deals as we bring on people. And at some point it becomes this hodgepodge mess that if you ended up having to publish it on the cover of your trade publication, it would be embarrassing. And as we know, people do talk. If you don't think it's happening, everyone talks within the company. Mark Andreessen's even addressed this head on at, at Andreessen Horowitz how it happens and why it happens, you better have your act together. And if you do, then you can better retain your talent. You can attract better talent and ultimately get it right and out of sight. What you really want to do is just get compensation off the table. What's worse is it's your largest expense or one of your largest expenses, and it's creating all kinds of demotivation within the organization. And that's just when you want to like get so frustrated. So anyway, we could we could dig into the details, but uh, I'd encourage folks to take a look at the book, Scaling Up Compensation. Yeah, but I, I just think that right there at the end, you really hit upon the issue um, with compensation, you can actually demotivate people. And it's really interesting how disconnected the logic of what we're trying to do and what we're actually having people end up, their psychology around where they end up and how they perform in your company just off a few dollars sometimes, or the way the compensation works. So yeah, and it's really interesting. There's probably two, two key points I'd share just in a few minutes we've got. You know, the first is think more like a professional sports team. Um, you've got a first, second, and third string quarterback. What is the difference between their comp? It can be 10x, if not 100x. And so first, it's not about equal pay. It's about fair. And there's nothing une more unequal than trying to pay people equally who are unequal. And so have very wide pay bands. And so at John Summers' company, Al Allied Printing, you know, a customer service rep comes in at about 80% of market and can progress to where they can earn up to twice their market rate. Uh, I'd rather have less people paid more than more people paid less. And he's got that with almost every position in the organization. The second thing John's done, and we highlight that, that in the book, is he then pays a company-wide bonus. But here's the smart thing. He only pays out 50% of that bonus. The other 50% vests over the next five years. And so as a, as a person stays, there are these bigger pots of money out in the future that are growing. And we know people do more to avoid a loss than to get a gain. And so somebody's going to think twice about leaving all of those future pots of money on the table. Now, wouldn't you think his employees are upset that he's sitting on half their bonus over the next five years? No, because you know the worst thing that can happen inside a great company is to lose one of your A players. We've seen that with sports teams. Man, they lose, Barcelona loses Messi, and you know it's it changes everything. Right. And so his employees appreciate that he's put in a pro a comp system that encourages the best people to stay long. And that's what helps stabilize your customer service and your reputation and your brand inside the organization. So just a couple of tweaks like that can make a huge difference with no additional cost and better cash flow in some sense for John as a result. Yeah, that, very interesting. And 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 I think that when you really get this compensation thing down, 
it really frees you up to go and do what you're really good at. Like you and you said you were teaching. That's what you wanted to do. Yeah. Right. And it frees you up to go teach. And then you don't have to run the day to day operations of your company and don't have to worry about all these variables that go on with the business on a day to day. That, yeah. that's you have the right people that take care of those issues and they're compensated for it. And, and it's really, I, I love the wide ban. I was sharing that with one of my clients because they were yeah. trying to put everyone in the same package. And I was going, but some of these people have a lot of experience and they're very upset about their salaries. And when they started looking at the wider band, they could actually see, okay, this person only has a year experience where this person has 10 years experience and very knowledgeable in this area. They should not be on the same scale, even though they're technically competent in similar thing. Yeah. So. Well, and, and that's why it's critical for you to have some good productivity measures you know, so I sent John out into his factory. Again, they're commercial printers. And he found he's got a guy out there called a cutter. You know, once the paper's been printed, now it needs to be cut before it's bound. He said, we got a guy that can do the work of 10. And and those are the ratios that really exist. You know, Bill Gates said the right one programmer can replace 10,000. And so you should compensate accordingly based on real productivity measures as they do in professional sports. So it forces you to get your KPI act together within the organization. Yeah, there's a story about the container store doing some of this uh, that we have used for quite a while in scaling up where they actually um, paid their employees a lot more and had a lot less employees, but they paid them a little bit more and it, they saved. And also the employees um, were trained really well. So they had good service on the floor because of what they did around their employees and the wages and things like that. Well, that's why Costco is really, you oh, know, yeah, has killed too. Sam's Club. You know, the average comp at, at Costco's dependent on position somewhere between 40 and 70 percent more than they would. Yet, when you look at revenue per employee, revenue per square foot, uh, they're twice yeah, they clean them. or more than what uh, their competitors are. So, again, I'd rather have less people paid more than more people paid less. And now you can create a virtuous cycle instead of, again, that vicious cycle that we all get caught in. Hey, Vern, uh, great honor having you here today. Um, thank you for allowing me to spend some of your uh, time because I know how valuable your time is and you donate it to us so readily and trying to help all of us coaches be more successful with scaling up. And I just really appreciate it. Love the brand that we're with with scaling up and just wanted to say thank you and then thank you, our audience thanks you for being so humble in the way that you shared some of the mistakes that you have and um and then how you overcame some of those things through your thinking yeah david thank you for having me on the show all right Vern. we'll have a great day and uh look forward to seeing you soon